Isaiah gives them a doxological, doctrinal description of God. Here they are wondering how they're going to get out. And Isaiah reminds them, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, doesn't faint or grow weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. Paul, you missed it. They're trying to figure out how they're going to get out. Isaiah says, you're asking the wrong question. Your question should not be, how we gonna get out? Your question ought to be, who's gonna do it? Because when you get the right who, you ain't got to worry about the how. Can I tell you why somebody in this place is discouraged today? Because you have forgotten who your God is. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, if God's been good to you, you've rented the right place. Come on, did you come to enter his gates with thanksgiving? Did anybody come and enter his courts with praise? Anybody thankful to him? Come on, let's bless his name for the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm reminded of a time when we could enter the sanctuary, whether it was Sunday or whatever day it was, when we found a need to connect with God and lay our burdens at His feet. I can remember walking into the sanctuary and just seeing people in different places crying out to God. And so it's with that spirit that we invite you to worship with us. The simple song that says, bow down and worship Him. He's a consuming fire. He's a sweet perfume, and even now, his presence is here. Come on, lift your hands if you recognize that he's already here. We're already in worship. Hallelujah. I invite you to sing with us. Bow down and worship him. Worship him. Oh, worship him. I hear you. Down, worship him, enter in, oh, enter in. Lift your voice and say it with us. Bow down.
Worship and praise right here. I love to praise Him.
have a reason. Come on to give God praise. Come on, I praise him because he saved me. I praise him because he raised me. Come on, come on, from the rising of the sun until the setting of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. So we enter his gates with thanksgiving and we enter God's courts with praise. We are thankful unto him. And even now we bless his name for the Lord indeed is worthy to be praised. Good morning, Alfred Street. If you would let us turn our attention to our scripture reading, which can be found in the letter to the Romans, 13th chapter, beginning with verse 8. And the word of the Lord reads in our hearing, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself for love does no harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfillment of the law this is the word of god for the people of god Amen. thanks be to god family as we continue in worship we lift those among us who are going through a season of bereavement we lift up catherine and curtis tola Ferro in the passing of their mother, Mevelyn Fudge. We lift Alana Albritton, in the passing of her mother, Orlinda Elder Albritton. And family, there may be some that you know, family or friends in person or watching virtually that you would like to lift up as we go to God in prayer. And I invite you to lift those names at this time. Let us go to God in prayer. Oh God, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. In fact, God, there is no other name that is above your name. And it is that name that we have come to worship, that name that we have come to magnify and adore on this Sunday morning. God, as we come to give your name the praise, we also lift those in our community that are traversing the valley of the shadow of death. God, we know you to be a company keeper and a tear wiper. God, we ask that you would be an ever-present presence in their lives. And then, oh God, as we prepare to go forward in this service, we lift up your manservant, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. Preach him like only you can. Allow him to preach to us that we may leave this place transformed and changed. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks and we simply say to have your way in this service. And all that agree with this prayer said, amen. amen. Sisters and brothers, at this time we ask that you join your voices with the male chorus as we lift an old familiar hymn of the church, Blessed Assurance. Oh, 
Beloved, as we rejoice in the blessed assurance of Jesus being ours, we ask that you pass the peace to one another. those who gather in this sacred space that we call sanctuary, to those who join us in the sacred space of virtual reality. Grace and peace melt each and every one of you from God who loves us as a mother and a father in Jesus Christ who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning redeemer. This moment as we enter into worship, we remind ourselves that the only thing that grants us access to the presence and the power of our God is the name of Jesus Christ. That in him we live and move and have our being and that in Christ we are new creatures. That Christ paid the price that we might dwell in worship and lift up the name of a God who is omnipotent, a God who is faithful, a God who is loving and a God who is forgiving. That's why we break bread and share in cup. We have an open communion at Alpha Street that we celebrate and share with anyone who's accepted and believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you came in today prayerfully, you received the elements of the Lord's Supper. If you did not, would you just wave a hand? There are deacons who are prepared to serve you now. We invite our online family to join in the reverence this moment as well. As you lay hold of whatever bread and cup you will use to represent the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. As we take hold of the bread, this bread represents the broken body of Jesus who alone and always is our Christ. He was crucified for our sins. He died on the cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, he arose victoriously by the power of God. He showed himself a risen savior. He ascended into heaven. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions for our sins. And one day, to the glory of God, we believe he is coming back. Let us break bread and eat together. In this cup, we prepare to drink that which reminds us of the shed blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. There's so many hymns that remind us of the power of the blood. I remind you today that nothing can wash away our sins other than the blood of Jesus Christ. And that in his blood we are forgiven. Let us drink together. Pray with me, family. 
Through our faith, we access what you offer to us in your grace. The complete forgiveness of each and every sin. The eternal security of our soul's salvation. The precious gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us into a life, O oh God, that is pleasing in your sight. And the commandment and the commission we have to spread your love and infect others with the love of Jesus Christ. God, you have forgiven us. And now teach us to forgive one another. And as you've loved us, may we seek to love one another. In the name of Christ our Savior, we do pray and give thanks. And the redeemed of the Lord, who loved the Lord, said amen. amen. Family, I welcome each and every one of you into worship on this day. We're grateful that God has given us another day. Although it's rainy outside, it's still a day that the Lord has made. And you ought to be mature enough to know that rain doesn't stop you from giving God glory, thanksgiving, and praise. So we thank God. You know you're maturing in life when you praise God for the rain. Not in spite of, but even for it. We thank God for gathering us in the space today. We welcome all those who may be with us for the very first time. If you are a guest of our church family and you don't mind being recognized, would you just wave a hand in the air and allow us to thank God for our guests who are with us today. Alpha Street, help me bless God and welcome our guests who worship with us on today. Welcome to each and every one of you. We thank you for joining us in worship today. To our online family, we welcome you. We know that with the, the ease and the expedition uh, of, of worship online, you could log on anywhere. And we're grateful to God that you've chosen to share these moments of worship with us. We celebrate the goodness of God. Are there any birthdays? Anybody have a recent birthday? If you're celebrating another year of life, won't you stand and allow us to thank God for you? All birthdays in the house as we stand. Welcome, Con congratulations, happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday to all of you. We thank God for giving you the grace to make it through another revolution of the earth around the sun, and we pray that God will continue to bless you with many more years of abundant life. We also pause today to recognize our anniversaries. The gift of love is an amazing gift of the Lord. If there's another couple today who's made it through another year of more better than worse and you decided to stick that thing out and give it another go, try again, I'm going to ask all our anniversaries to stand that we may acknowledge any couples celebrating another year of life. Please stand and remain standing. Please remain standing. We call out how many years as a way of encouraging ourselves. How many years are you all celebrating? Seven, congratulations on seven wonderful years of marriage. In the back, how many of you all celebrating? You, yeah, my brother right here. You, you. 29. 29, congratulations on 29 years. Bless you. And how many of you all celebrating today? Four, amen, four. Congratulations on your fourth anniversary. Where's one more? Oh, Kim, oh, Kim you kept Dan. How, how long have you been keeping him right? Congratulations on 28 years to you and Dan. Oh, and I'm sorry to see the back. How many years are we celebrating? 52. All right. Congratulations. Amen. Amen. Lean over somebody say, be encouraged, be encouraged. <laughs> Listen, family, there's just a few announcements I want to lift up. The first is that, as always, we invite and encourage you to be prayerful in our time of giving. We don't raise an official offering during our worship. It's not because we're not dependent upon your giving. It's because we trust you to do the right thing. That an usher doesn't have to pass a plate for you to be reminded that God's been good to you. And in response to that, we give generously back to the Lord what the Lord places on our heart. I could stand today and give you a sermon about tithing, but at the end of the day, the truth of the matter is when you pray and ask God what to give and you obey what the Lord says to you, the church will be blessed and benefited for the work that we've been called to do. So I want to invite and encourage you to use all the platforms available uh, that are convenient for you as a way of giving um, to the Lord. Nope, nope, nope. We've got altar call. We've got to bring back call. Yep, yep. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey. Amen. Hey, our power's over. Uh, 
So won't you be... <laughs> Won't you be faithful in your giving, obedient in your spirit, and generous as you render unto the Lord that which God places upon your heart to do? I want to thank all of you all who are able to participate and those who helped in the planning of our beginning of our celebration of 15 years of pastor and people. Last night we gathered and were blessed in music of worship by Israel Hope and New Breed. Typically, I don't like surprises, but I like that one last night hear one of my favorite worship artists come and to bless us in song. And I thank all of you all who are able to participate. Don't forget that although you may have missed Israel, you get me on the 20th of September. Um, amen. We, we're, we're gathering in this space for praising and praying with the pastor. So if you couldn't hear Israel sing it, come on out and amen. Share with the pastor uh, for a night of singing the hymns of the church and for some concerted time in prayer. And then if you will remember on the last Sunday of this month, uh, we welcome Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. They're bringing their mass choir to be in worship with us. Remember, is that the 28th or 24th? The 24th. On the 24th, we will not be in this building. On the 24th of September, we have one worship service at Strathmore at 11 a.m. where we'll welcome Wheeler Avenue, their pastor, the Reverend Dr. Marcus Cosby and their mass choir to join us in the celebration of what God joined together some 15 years ago. And so if you would join us either live or online, that service will be live streamed, but please don't show up here. We will not be here at eight o'clock. We will not be here at 11. We'll be over at the Strathmore and we invite you to join in with us. Tomorrow is a day of remembrance of September 11th. We remember those whose lives were sacrificed in an act of terror. We remember our own member, Ada Mason, and her family whose life was taken on that day, as well as we pray for this nation as we continue to heal and recognize, Otis, that the greatest terror we threat face is not foreign, but the greatest terror is domestic. And we pray for the healing of this land. I shouldn't say I'm afraid because the Bible says we ought not fear, but I am deeply concerned about how 2024 is going to play out. And the way in which these elections will go and the consequence of what will happen. And God says, my people were called by my name when they pray that God will answer. So we want to bring back altar call. Um, an opportunity to come in to pray. And today I want to lift up a special prayer and invite to the altar those we're involved in our school systems. Our children are back on campus, and we all know that that's become a target for those that are demonically minded. Today, you can stand, you can sit, you can come to the altar, but especially if you are a principal, an administrator, a counselor, a teacher, a concerned parent, a grandparent, an aunt, that you wanna stand in for a child, that we're going to cover in prayer today, I invite you to the altar. The altar's open for those who want to come. You can stand, you can sit, you can come to the altar. But let's get ready to pray over our children and our schools this morning. One of the names we learned this summer was the name Jehovah Nisi. That God is our banner. And it means much more than a God who fights our battles. It means a God who covers us. A God whose name, a God whose grace, a God whose protection covers those who dare walk with him. Would you bow with me? God, today we come to you knowing that you are the great I am. And we're so grateful that you are Jehovah Nisi, our banner, our covering, the one whose hand keeps us from hurt, harm, danger, and terror. Today we come believing, oh God, that the same hand that kept Job safe when the enemy targeted him is the hand that rests 
over those for whom we pray today. We pray, O oh Lord, that as this school year begins and our valuable and our vulnerable loved ones that we call children, as they make their way on that campus, oh God, as they make their way into those school buildings, as they walk into classroom, God, I am grateful that you are not limited or locked into the corner of Duke and Alfred Street, that it doesn't have to have a cross on the steeple for you to be present in the building. There don't have to be Bibles and hymnals. There can be math books and textbooks right in front. And right there, you show yourself strong. Today, oh God, we pray your covering over our children. One too many times we have seen the demonic mindset of those who would dare enter these sacred spaces and attack those who've done nothing. God, I feel it not wrong. In the name and by the blood of Jesus to ask you to cover our classrooms. God, we pray that you would be in the heart and the mind of those who serve not because they're paid well, but because they're called to this assignment. For those school teachers, oh God, for those administrators, for those counselors, for those who seek to raise up a generation that changes this world. God, we pray over their hearts and their minds. God, we pray that you would give them a spirit not to grow weary in well-doing, that you allow them to hear the words, well done, that you give them a joy that a salary could never provide. God, that they would hear the testimony of children that say, because of you, I did better. Because of you, I believe. Because of you, I'm able. Because of you, I rose above stereotype. God, thank you for those who serve, for those who teach, for those who guide. God, I want to pray for the relationship of parent and teacher. God, that we would be reminded as those who raise our children, that we do not send them to school, but we partner with the school to raise them, that they may grow in their mind and their strength. God, build a partnership between parent and teacher. God, I want to pray over all those who enter that building. I want to pray for those that work behind the lunch counter. I want to pray for those who hold the broom and the mop. I want to pray, oh God, for the security guards that are in that place. I want to pray for the crossing attendants that stand outside blowing the whistle. God, may your grace rest upon each and every one of them. God, we pray for our children. I would right now that you mention the name aloud of a child that you know you're praying for right now. Name them in this space. Now, O oh God, now, O oh God, may your grace be sufficient. May your mercies be brand new. And Lord, may we like Elijah see that you've shown yourself strong. God, I pray from now to commencement that there be no shedding of blood. I ask you, O oh God, to hear the prayer of the righteous. The blood of Jesus was all that ever needed to be shed. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline your ear unto us and grant us your peace. And now unto him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. To that God be glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And those who trusted and believed in God said amen, 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 and amen. Come on, let's praise God in advance for a successful school year. Amen. You may return to your seats. 
family, as you're returning and as the male chorus gets ready to bless us, I do want to remind you that we are in the season of nominations. We're preparing for our annual meeting and going into this new year. And I'm asking you to be prayerful about whether there's a call and assignment in your life to serve in leadership of the church. Nominations are due at the end of this month. We invite you to go online to see the various descriptions and opportunities you have to serve. I just believe someone today, God's calling you to do much more than go through another year of watching church. But that the assignment of God is to help us build that which prepares a legacy for those who come after us. We're asking you to be prayerful, to go online, to nominate either yourself or to speak to someone else that you want to say, hey, you know what, I think God's calling you to that. Amen. I'm going to submit your name. Uh, <laughs> and the will of the Lord be done. We receive now the male chorus to give us the word of God in song, and then we receive the word of God in sermon.
There's something special about hearing that hymn with all that bass. Yeah. Brothers, thank you for, uh, for redefining male chorus. Yeah, yeah. I've been in many a church and when you hear the male chorus is singing, Just pray the Lord get you through. <laughs> but brothers, thank you. Thank you. Help me bless God for the men of Alpha Street one more time. Amen. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A little while ago, I was speaking with one of my mentees in ministry. We start reflecting over these 15 years we've shared as pastor and people. He said to me, Pastor, let's play a game. I want to play a game called Pastor's Picks. I didn't understand what he meant at first there, but he said, I want you to share with me your favorites. Give me your 15 favorite books or authors that have shaped your ministry. And very quickly, I was able to rattle off the 15 books that have shaped me, like The Cost of Discipleship, books by Howard Thurman, the works of Ralph Ellison and, and Toni Morrison. He then said, all right, well, list for me your 15 favorite gospel hymns and, and artists. And I was quickly able to rattle off, come thou fount of every blessing. I was able to share with them the worship songs that have shaped my life. He then said, share with me your top 15 favorite preachers. Without pause, I was able to name my father and Gardner Taylor and, and Sam Proctor and Gina Stewart, Elaine Flake, preachers that have shaped who I am. He then said, and can you give me your 15 favorite scriptures? And I think he was shocked because right then and there, I had to pause. The reason I paused is because I love all the Bible. 
all 31,102 verses, they're in the word of God, have a way of leading you into the abundant life that Jesus died for you to have. Y'all, let me tell you without shadow of doubt or with any fear of contradiction, that from Genesis 1 and 1 to Revelation 22 and 21, that if you read the word of God, it will align your life with the will of God and keep you from damnation in this life and the next. I believe the word of God. I will sign up with the psalmist who said in Psalm 119, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. And that's why for these last 15 years, I may have sounded like a broken record because I've stood here Sunday after Sunday and told you the same thing. Read your Bible. It'll make you a better Christian. I pause, Ricardo, not because I didn't have a favorite, but that I recognize that as the seasons of my life have changed, and as I've had to go and grow through the inevitable challenges that all of us will face, as I've had to stand and face the trials that all of us will go through, I found that there have been different passages that I have recited to myself. Because CJ, I come to tell you, you better know the word of God because you're going to need the word when you don't have a Bible. Let me say that again. There's going to come a moment when you need the word even when you don't have a Bible. And based upon that conversation, I want to take these next few Sundays in September and October and then ask you to allow me to preach a sermon called Pastor's Picks. I want to walk you through some of the scriptures and the verses in the Bible that have held my life together. Promises of God that have kept my hope alive. Scriptures that have given me the strength to face whatever life might bring, whatever God might take me through. I want to share with you how Galatians 6 and 9 held me together when Paul says, let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I want to remind you why Romans 8 and 18 mean so much to me. For I reckon that the suffering of the present age is not worthy to be compared with the glory that God shall reveal in us. I want you to know why my mama made me learn Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. He is the king of glory. I want to tell you how in the death of my father, Paul's words in 2 Corinthians, that if this earthly tabernacle passes away, we've got another home. Today, though, as we begin this journey, I want to invite you to hear what I know is familiar to you. And prayerfully, God will preach it in an unfamiliar manner. One of Judy, what I consider the most profound and poetic verses in all the Bible. Here's my number one pick. You'll find it in the prophecy of Isaiah. If you're able and willing, I invite you to stand and hear the words of Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse number 27. When you get there, it reads a little something like this. Why do you say, O Jacob? And why do you speak, O Israel? Why, why are you saying, my ways are hidden from the Lord? And my just claim is passed over by my God. Here it is. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor grows weary. 
His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. Those who have no might, he increases their strength. Even the youth shall faint and grow weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. Notice that what Isaiah says in verse 28 is the same thing he says in verse 22. Have you not known and have you not heard? Do me a favor, your neighbor ain't going to like this, but lean over to him and tell him, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Have you not known? Have you not heard? What's wrong with you? These words are familiar to most of us in this place. If you've been in church for more than a season, you've probably come to a place in your life where you've recited these words to yourself, they that wait on the Lord. Paul Hansen, a scholar of the book of Isaiah, says that these words are a succinct summary of the entire book of Isaiah. If you read all 66 chapters, Aaron, the one thing you ought to walk away with is this. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. If I can teach the Bible, Jeremiah and Ezekiel are longer than Isaiah in terms of word count. But Isaiah's prophecy with its 66 books covers a longer period of time than any other book in the Bible. The prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 1 begins sometime around 742 B.C. during the reign of King Uzziah. The prophecy continues through the reign of Jotham, continues through the reign of Hezekiah, continues through the reign of Ahaz continues through the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 by Nebuchadnezzar, continues through the Babylonian exile, and goes all the way to the end of the exile when those who've been exiled are returning back to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, if you total it all up, Isaiah covers 226 years. Tell somebody tell me that's a long time. And Dr. Judy will tell you that because of its length and some textual and theological insights, scholars believe that the book of Isaiah is not the oracle of just one prophet. But rather, Isaiah, the book you read, is really the prophecy of at least three men. In scholarship, the first one is called First Isaiah. First Isaiah, that is the son of Amos, for whom the book is named after. It is that, a, that Isaiah who we read about in Isaiah 6, who says that in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That, that first Isaiah is accredited with chapters 1 through 39. Then there's 2nd Isaiah. 2nd Isaiah's calling by the Lord comes in chapter 40 in verse 1 with the assignment, comfort my people. And scholars agree that 2nd Isaiah is responsible for chapters 40 through chapter 55. And then there is 3rd Isaiah, who's accredited with chapters 56 through 66. There are three Isaiahs, 1st Isaiah, 2nd Isaiah, 
and third Isaiah. And the reason second Isaiah and third Isaiah are called second and third is because we don't know their names. So we just gave them Isaiah. <laughs> These words that we lift up today from chapter 40 come from second Isaiah. Second Isaiah. And to understand the depth of what he says, you've got to remember who he's talking to. This prophecy of 2 Isaiah begins somewhere before the beginning of the end of the exile. Make certain you remember this, that, that this Isaiah is speaking to a people who are about to experience the end of the Babylonian exile. There and these are the people who watched and witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem. They still have in their mind the images of the temple being destroyed. Yes. Otis, they can close their eyes and, and smell the fires of their homes burning. My God, my God. Yeah. They have the trauma, Latasha, of, of knowing that they were snatched from their homes and forced to live in Babylon. These are people who got to Babylon and believed it would only be for a little while, only to find out we're going to be here for some time. These are the folk who have given up hope that anything will ever get better. These Lolita are people who have given birth to children in exile. They have the commandment to raise these children with faith in God, but they're struggling to pass on the faith to their children that they don't even have themselves. These are the people, Judy, who wrote Psalm 137. Psalm 137, they say, we sat by the rivers of Babylon, and they said to us, sing one of them praise songs. And these folks said, how can we praise God in a strange land like this? These folk have gotten to a place where there is no hope, there's only despair, and they believe God ain't even worthy to be praised in the middle of this. And God calls this second Isaiah to come to these people and tell them it's the beginning of the end. When you go home and you reread Isaiah 40, you'll see in verse 1 through 11, the prophet is given this assignment, comfort the people. And when you read verse 11, God says, this is what I want you to tell them. Tell them that your debt has been paid. Tell them that I'm about to return them back to Jerusalem. Let them know the glory of the Lord is about to be revealed. Let them know things are about to get better. Let them know I've heard their cry and I'm coming to deliver them. Give them a word of hope. Give them a word of encouragement. Reignite their faith. Let them know God is about to do something. In case you ain't got it, he assigns the second Isaiah just like he did Sam Cooke. It's been a long time coming. But I know a change is on the way. This, this second Isaiah shows up to tell them God wants you to be comforted and know that the beginning of the end is right here. This, this exile is about to be over. And the Bible says that when they hear it, they struggle to believe it. They struggle to receive it. They struggle to accept it. They ask the question, how can God do it when we've been here so long? What God going to do after 50 years of this? How can God deliver us when Nebuchadnezzar is still on the throne? These are folks so filled with doubt and despair and discouragement and disappointment in God that they said there's no way this can happen. Beloved, allow me to tell you before you judge them that if you live your life long enough, life will put you 
right there. If you live long enough, life will put you in a place where you've been waiting for it to happen so long, you begin to doubt if it will ever happen. Somebody, you know what it's like to be praying for something so often and get no answer that you convince yourself ain't no point in praying anymore. Somebody, you know what it's like for your hopes to be so discouraged by your reality that now you've de declared to yourself it is safer just to live with no expectation. You've dealt with so many bad folk that you just convinced yourself everybody ain't no good. You've been waiting on God for something for so long that God has not done that now you've given up expectation that God will ever do it and you can reach a place where you begin to lose your faith in the goodness of God and in the reality of God. Yeah, I know I'm preaching to you because that's where these Israelites are. When they hear these words from 2 Isaiah, they say to him in verse 27, God don't care about us. God doesn't see what we're going through. God gave up on us a long time ago. If God cared, this wouldn't be happening. Beloved, I know your Bible is big and I know you know all the words of great is thy faithfulness. But allow me to tell you that none of us are immune from verse 27. You keep living long enough, life will put you in verse 27. Life will put you in the place where you feel like God has forgotten. When it feels like the Lord ain't answering your prayers. When you come to church and you hear this preacher preach and you walk out and believing that he was talking to everybody but you. Because if God cared about me, this wouldn't be happening to me. Now I want you to watch what happens. They, they, they've heard the word of encouragement. They've heard the gospel of Sam Cooke. They say back to the prophet, there's no way this can happen. And watch how Isaiah shifts. This prophet who was called to comfort. This prophet who was called to encourage. This prophet who was called to bring a good word. He looks back at him and says, hold on. Have you not known? Have you not heard? You know what he says in a real sense? What's wrong with y'all? And I came by to ask the same question of someone who's sitting in verse 27 on this Sunday. What? What's wrong with you? How do you come to this place with, with that kind of doubt and that kind of discouragement? When did you lose your hope? When did your faith evaporate? When did your expectation die? When did you let go of God? When did you convince yourself that nothing good will ever happen? What's wrong with you? Look, listen, listen to what Isaiah says to folk in verse 27. He says, have you not known, have you not heard, watch this, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor grows weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. You, you missed it. Uh, uh, they're saying God has forgotten about us. and God has abandoned us. And Isaiah says, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor grows weary, and there's no searching of his understanding. Okay, one more time for those that are slow. Up top, um, the everlasting Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he doesn't faint, he doesn't grow weary, and there's no understanding what he's doing. Y'all, watch this. Th they are trying to figure out how God will bring them out. And Isaiah's answer is a doctrinal, doxological description of God. Okay, you, you missed it. They want to know how. Isaiah says you're asking the wrong question. Your question should not be, 
how. Your question should be who? Because if you got a hold of the right who, you ain't really got to worry about the how. What? Here's, here's your problem. You have forgotten who your God is. So he said, let me pause and remind you about the God we serve. We don't serve some weak and wimpy God. We don't serve some God who watches your life like you watch Sunday football. We, we don't serve a God who decided to walk away from you because you messed up in life. We don't serve that kind of God. Your problem is you need to be reminded of who he is. He is the everlasting God. Ain't no time when God wasn't, and ain't no time when God ain't going to be. Wherever you find yourself, God has already been there. God is on his way there, and God has already left there. He's everlasting, and he's the Lord. He is sovereign. Your problem is you think God's jurisdiction ended in Jerusalem. But I came by to tell you, wherever you find yourself, he is Lord. He's the creator of the ends of the earth, and he doesn't faint nor grow weary. Ricardo Birdsong, he reminds them of who God is to suggest to them don't ever let what you don't understand about God cause you to forget what you do. Okay, uh, uh, um, don't ever let what you know about God call into question what you don't know about God. Don't ever let what you're going through cause you to forget the God that you serve. Watch what he says. I love it. I love the staring. He says, and there's no searching of his understanding. Um, you can't always understand God. I'm sorry. You can't always understand God. This same Isaiah in chapter 40 We'll come back in chapter 55 and say this. As the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways above our ways, that God's ways are bigger than yours. That you can't always understand God. I don't know who needs to hear this, but nobody has a PhD in God. Nobody fully understands God. And what Isaiah is trying to remind them of is what I want to share with you. And that is that because God's ways are greater than our ways, and because he is creator, there are, oh, this everyone ain't going to get this, there are realities in God that are not even possibilities in your imagination. Oh, boy. Maybe they'll holler at 11. Uh, there are realities in God that aren't even possibilities in your imagination. God has ways that you can't even begin to think about and dream about and imagine because there is no searching of his understanding. I wish I had a Bible reader's eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard. The good things God has in store, you can't even dream it. Okay, okay, look, look, look. watch this. Isaiah says, listen, y'all are wondering how, but you won't, if, if I told you, you wouldn't be able to understand. Because watch how God's going to bring them out, y'all. This, this is amazing. They've been under Babylonian exile, under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians have ruled the world. But down the road, 
there's another ruler coming uh, from the Persian Empire by the name of Cyprus. And, and he comes and he destroys Babylon, takes over Babylon, and then he's the one who befriends the Jews and gives them permission to go back home. Oh, Isaiah said, listen, you, you didn't even see that coming. God is about to use another enemy to conquer your enemy to open a door you didn't even know existed for you to get back. The way God is going to do it, you couldn't, if, if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. Okay, some of y'all slow on Sunday. Uh, I'm coming from Tyson's the other day running to get back to church. And as I'm running and trying to get back to church for a meeting, I'm realizing it's about 4.30. You, you already, you, you already know. And, and where I got on in Tyson, I made the mistake. Um, I didn't get on the easy pass because I missed the entrance. So now I'm on the beltway coming from Tyson's trying to get to church to make a meeting. You already know. Um, and, and, and around about the mixing bowl where, where you come off and you start making your way to Alexandria, the traffic start backing up. I, I don't know why y'all can't just drive across the bridge. Just, just. That accident over there ain't got nothing to do with you. You just... So the traffic backs up. So I pull up Waze because Waze will tell you how long the traffic jam is. I want to know how long I'm going to be delayed so I can call Mel at the office and tell, listen, tell them I'm going to be such and such minutes late because Waze says it's about 32 minute delay. So I pull up Waze, it tells me it's about 30 minutes in traffic. Then it says something, it says, but we found another route. Would you like to try another way? I ain't got nothing to lose. So I hit yes. Dr. Joyce, this tripped me out. It pulled me off the beltway, took me around the neighborhood, had me drive down through Kingstown, wound up putting me on Telegraph to then swing around Delaney Lane and go through another residential neighborhood and come up on the backside of church. I didn't even know you could go that way. I did not know there is a way from where I was to where I was trying to go that I did not know. But because Waze saw a different way that I did not understand, I don't know who I came to preach to, but if you trust the navigation to pick up a way that you don't even know, how much more are you trust God that God has a way that you don't even understand. I need somebody at Alpha Street that can look back over your life and say the way God did it, I never saw coming. The way God moved, I could not have predicted. Is there anybody here that God blew your mind? He used your enemies. He took you down an alley. You went the long way. But thanks be to God, Um, he says, you need to remember who your God is. And you're worried because you don't understand how. But God has ways you couldn't even begin to understand. I, I'm sorry, but let me tell you, there are folk in here who know you got yourself in some mess. And the way God fixed that thing the way God handled it was nothing you could have predicted. No, sir. No, sir. So the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, and the faint so grows weary, his understanding is unsearchable. Y'all need to remember who your God is. Yeah. And then I love this, and he gives power to the weak and the faint. Yeah. Watch this, watch this. You're going to love this. I'm going to see if you love Bible like I do. Isaiah says, God doesn't faint or grow weary, <laughs> but he gives strength to those who do. Uh, God does not grow faint or weary, but you and I do. 
And when we get faint and weary, God gives us strength. I was doing my sermonic homework so that I could be certain to teach today, and I noticed that the words faint and weary show up repeatedly in this prophecy. So I've been taught to learn to look at the original languages to understand what may be missing in English. And so because I read a little bit of Hebrew and because I employ a professor of Hebrew at Alpha Tree Baptist Church, I always have access to a dictionary. <laughs> and the terms for faint and weary literally mean to get exhausted. To get weak. You know, a literal translation means to reach a place where there's no more effort. Yeah. Yeah. Faint and weary is when you've been going through it so much, you just ain't got no more try in you. You ever been faint? You ever been weary? You ever been a... When my Marvin Gaye folk make me want to holler. Throw a birth my hands. You ever, you ever had a Teddy Pendergrass moment, better let it go? <laughs> now if your neighbor ain't smiling, tell them you need to grow up, you need to grow up. You, you. Um, it, it, it means to reach the place where you just ain't got no mo in you. Here's what Isaiah says, y'all have gotten there, but watch this, the God you serve gives you strength when you get to no mo. The, 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 the word strength and th that it says is this, this Hebrew term koach. Everyone say koach. Koach, K-O-H-A, but you pronounce it as if there's a C in it, koach. Koach, it means strength, it means might, but the root of the word means to be firm. Here's why Isaiah says, when you ain't got no mo in you, God will help you. Be firm. <laughs> God will give you some uh, back in your backbone. God will give you some steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, which is a Bible reading in this place, in the work of the Lord. God will give you some, I'm standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. He'll give you some hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. He'll, he'll give you some, I shall not be moved. He, he gives you some firmness when you ain't got no more effort in you. Can I push it? The word co-op, the root is firm. But Judy, this is what killed me. That sometimes the word co-op was used to describe, watch this, a lizard. A lizard? L lizard? And doing the work, Judy, the lizard they're referring to was a chameleon. Um, that the strength God gives me is the ability to be like a chameleon. <laughs> I'm gonna shout myself. Uh, uh, and what the Jews understood is that the chameleon has the ability to survive. Whatever environment, it's going to make it. Whatever environment, it's going to do whatever it's got to do because you ain't taking me out. The chameleon says to itself, there's something inside of me that says no matter what, if it's green, I'm going to make it through green. If it's brown, I'm going to make it through brown. If it's gray, baby, I'm going to make it through gray. So what God gives me is the firm ability to survive. So here's what Isaiah says, what's wrong, what's wrong with you? Your problem is you're complaining about what you're living with, but you forgot you're living with it. Y'all gonna make a brother preach on Sunday? Uh, um, you, you're, you're complaining that you're going through it, but you forgot you're going. You're mad that you woke up in it, 
when you ought to be shouting that you woke up. I wish I had some folk in here that are mature enough to be able to praise God in the middle of it because God is still helping me survive what I'm going through. Uh, uh, uh. He says, you think God has abandoned you, but baby, if God had abandoned you, you wouldn't be here today. You think God forgot about you, but if God forgot about you, you wouldn't have woke up this morning. You ought to thank God. Um, um, okay, okay. Uh, I, I know we got to go. It ain't our power, but uh, uh, you know what this is? This, this is my, my favorite scene from one of my favorite movies. It's my favorite scene from one of my favorite movies called Color Purple. Y'all saw Color Purple? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can't wait to see the new one coming out on Christmas. Amen. We're going to have a faith in film series. We're buying the whole theater out. We're going to go see Color Purple. Uh, and y'all, some of y'all remember my favorite scene in Color Purple is that Thanksgiving dinner. Because because that's when Miss Seeley decide she didn't have about all she gonna take. Yeah, y'all, y'all remember Suge came in, and, and Suge talking about she leaving and she going back to get on stage and, and, and Tweet said, I'm going with Suge and, and then Miss Seeley said, I'm going with Suge too. And, 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 and Mr. looked at her and said, you ain't going nowhere. And she grabbed that knife out that turkey. She stuck it in Mr. Face, said, when I ever ask you for anything? I ain't asked for this house. I ain't even asked for your blankety blank hand in marriage. I, I ain't asked you for nothing. And, and, and she's on her way out. And, and Mr. looked at her and said, where you gonna go? You black, you skinny, and you ugly. She got in that car with Shug. I want you to watch when you get home. She's on her way out. She turns back to Mr. and says, I may be black. I may be skinny. I may be ugly. But thank God, I'm still here. I wish I had some Miss Seely praisers in Alfred Street today who can thank God that I'm still here, been through it, but here, broken, but here, discouraged, but here, I'm here by the grace of my God. <laughs> Touch my tell I'm still here, I'm still here. Uh, okay, 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 I got to go, it's Sunday school time. I said, what's wrong with you? you? You forgot who your God is. What's wrong with you? You forgot you're still making it. And then watch how he closes. He says, and even youth shall faint and grow. Does that faint and grow? Even youth shall faint and grow weary, and young men shall utterly fall. Now, now this messed me up there because he says youth will faint and grow weary. I just told you faint and grow weary means to get to the point where you ain't got no more try in you. Well, this don't make no sense because youth, by definition, don't faint and get weary. You too young to have a quit in you. You too young to say, I'm tired. So you, you ain't even been through nothing. How can youth faint grow weary, and fall. Oh, that's why you come now. Why? How can youth faint, grow weary, and fall? I was struggling with this until I realized that what Isaiah is doing is making a dichotomous contrast between two groups of folk. Go and preach, Pastor. Uh, uh, the youth who faint and grow weary, but they that wait on the Lord. 
And I realized, Earl, that Isaiah is not making a contrast between youth and elderly. Because if he were, he would say, even youth shall faint and grow weary, but elderly. No, no. He says, but they that wait on the Lord. The contrast is that on one hand, you got folk who faint and grow weary. And on the other hand, you've got those who've learned to trust in God. And the reason they call them young is because when you are young, you make the mistake of thinking that you don't have to trust in God. You think you can make it by yourself. Uh, you think you've got enough strength to deal with life. Uh, you think you can carry this burden by yourself. Uh, he says, now spiritual maturity ain't how old you are. Spiritual maturity is how much you learn to trust in God. Uh, and the minute you realize you can't do this by yourself, the minute you realize you need God in your life, the minute you realize you can trust in God, that's when your strength is renewed. That's when you mount up on wings as eagles. That's when you run and don't get weary. That's when you walk and don't faint because you've learned to trust in God. I'm done, y'all. Here's what Isaiah is saying to us in verse 27. When you reach there in your life, he says, listen, by now... There's some things you should know. By now, you should know you can trust in God. By now, you should know that God will answer your prayers. You, you too old to think that God has forgotten about you. I don't know who I came to preach to today. I want to remind you, this ain't the first time you've had to trust in God. Look, I ain't looking for no child. I'm looking for the mature saints who know this ain't the first problem you've had. This ain't the first situation you've gone through. This isn't the first diagnosis you've had to live through. This isn't the first time you had to call on God. This isn't the first time you waited on God. Is there anybody here who knows what God has done for you? I need some folk to say, I know that 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 God will make a way somehow, that God will open doors, that God will answer prayer, that God will make a way out of no way. Okay, uh, 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 I gotta go. He says, you should know that and watch this and you should have heard that. Can I tell you what, what, why Isaiah wants to know what's wrong with you? Because after everything you've heard, you still doubt God. Uh, here's the problem. You come to church too much to waver with God. You didn't heard me preach too much to question God. You've heard too much. Okay, let, let, let me, Zine, let me go home. Um, so I do my weekly check-in with the boy at college. You know, because he won't call or text me, so I got to track him down. And, and, and CJ gets mad because I don't want to do it on text. You're you going to talk to me. Because if I text him, he'd give me one-word answers. How you doing? Fine. High school? Good. Anything happening? No. You need anything? Money. You know. You... One-word answers. So we got the thing there, and every Sunday I call you, we talk. Answer your phone, or your phone ain't gonna work. So I called him. I said, man, how's school going? He said, Dad, I'm a little nervous. I got my first test coming up. He's got his first test there. They're, they're, I can't believe that it's going by so fast. They're almost in midterm. They're almost in midterm after a month. So he said, Dad, I got my first test coming up. I said, well, son, have you studied? He said, yeah, I've been studying. I said, have you prayed? He said, yeah, I've prayed about it. I said, well, well there's one more thing. I'm going to give you a piece of advice from someone who's been there that's going to help you pass the test. Don't miss this. After you study and after, after you've read and you've seen and after you pray, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do to pass the test. Hey, this is real simple, y'all. You need to find someone who had the class last year. 
and you find someone who passed the class last year, and you go to them and you ask them, can you see their exam from last year? That's not cheating, that's smart. You, you, you. No, no. If you're gonna pass the exam, you gotta find someone that's already taken it and ask them what the answers were because if you find someone that already passed it, they can give you the answers that you need to pass the test you're about to take. You ain't caught it yet. That when you're about to face it yourself, you gotta find someone who's already been through it and ask them what was the answer to the exam. And if you find someone that's already been through it, they will tell you how to make it through when it's your turn. Goodbye, Alfred Street. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But I come here every Sunday looking for somebody that's already been through that. Somebody that's already faced it. Someone that's already lived through it. That's why you ought to encourage your neighbor and let them know God is able. And if God did it for me, then God is able to do it for you. All right. Uh, what's wrong with you? Don't you know who God is? What's wrong with you? God hadn't abandoned you. You're still living in this. What's wrong with you? You've, you've seen too much. You've heard too much. So here's what I'm encouraging you to do. It's real simple. Here's the end of the matter. Wait on the Lord. The old saints used to put it like this. You, you can't hurry God. <laughs> You just have to wait. You got to trust and give him time. No matter how long it takes. He's a God, you can't hurry. But he'll be there. Don't you worry. Here's what, he may not come <laughs> when you want him to. But he's always right on. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Wait on the Lord. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and they won't get weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And he will strengthen your heart. David said, I waited patiently on the Lord. The Lord delivered me from all my afflictions. Wait on the Lord. Beloved, I want you to leave this place today not as a youth who will faint and grow weary, but on the other side as someone who's learned to trust in God. We have a saying here at Alpha Street that I share with you. That's I'm not promising you that life with God will be easy, but I am assuring you that life without God is impossible that you can't carry this by yourself. You can't make this by yourself. You can't handle this by yourself. You need God in your life. And there's only really one way to get God. It's not simply by joining church. It's not by being religious. It's not by going down to the bookstore and getting a Bible and a hymnal. It's by opening your heart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I know it's not politically correct, but Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The only way I can recommend you to get in a right relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. And once you get right with God, God calls you into right relationship with others. Salvation is not an isolated experience. It's one that requires membership in a family of faith. And if you're looking for a perfect church, stop because there is none. But if you're looking for a place that pushes you to grow and to love and to serve, I recommend this family of faith. Whether you're with us today or if you're watching online, this invitation is extended to you. Today, after the end of service, if you desire to open your heart to the Lordship of Jesus, if you're ready to connect with a family of faith that's not perfect, but is pursuing the call of God, there'll be some deacons at the altar and in the narthex They've got our name tags, tap them on the shoulder. They'll be glad to welcome you. If you're watching online, fill out that form even now. Let us know who you are 
and we'll connect with you today to let you know what God wants you to be. We leave this place not only as hearers of the word, but now doers. What's wrong with you? Let's leave this place encouraged in the faith to wait on God as the male course blesses us in our final selection. sovereign, the faithful and omnipotent God who alone is creator of heaven and earth, to the God who's made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus, who always and alone is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial Savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning Redeemer, to the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose and person of the Holy Spirit. To that all wise God be glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And the redeemed of the Lord who loved the Lord and awaited his return said amen. God, and may the grace of God go with you.